Hey everybody, welcome back to Faraday Research, and I'm just doing a quick little video tonight. Um, I imagine everybody's trying to figure out the circuit for the Don Smith generator. So what I've done is I've drawn up the uh, schematic here, so if you want to pause it at any time, you can do that and take like a screenshot. And this is basically the layout of what I'm working with right now. So you can stop it at any point. I'm trying to keep it steady so you can do a screenshot. All right, so everybody's got a screenshot. Okay, good. All right, so let's carry on here. So we'll start off, we got the high voltage uh, um, power source. Uh, you can get use those uh, air purifier uh, high voltage modules. Uh, the one I have can do 11 kVA at uh, 30 milliamps. So you would use your battery here, positive, negative. You can vary the power. This one will go down, I believe, as low as 3.7 volts at about 4,000 uh, 4, volts. And you can go as high as 12 volts, which would give 11 kVA. So you can kind of gauge your uh, power by that. So let's go on to the positive this is the high voltage that comes out of the module. This is where you're getting your, you know, your uh, 11 kVA or 6 kVA, or depending on how much power you put in from your battery. So you could put a variable PWM controller on it, power supply, whatever you wish. You could even as much, if you get the right solar panel, you could even use a solar power uh, system to run this, which is really cool. As the high voltage mo module, if I run it at, say, 6 volts, it would take about 350 milliamps to run the, the module. So that's pretty decent. It's actually very little power. So let's carry on. Uh, we got the high voltage coming in. So uh, you're going to buy uh, the 10 kVA uh, 220 picofarad capacitors, and you're going to put them in series, okay? So... Um, you could either put, actually, you could put them in series, but I actually prefer um, to go, actually, yeah, this is kind of a mistake. Um, I would put them in uh, parallel. So you would put um, three of them in between these connections. So actually, technically, I should draw this over and connect it. But you can do it in parallel, depending on the type of capacitor you're using. I'm using the ceramic ones, so you would connect it from uh, positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative. But if you get electrolytic ones, uh, you could do it in series like this. So it all depends on the capacitor that you choose. All right, so we're going to go to the L1 coil. This is the one that energizes L2. So I kind of wrote them side by side. So I'll make it a little bit easier to understand. So I used 18 gauge wire, six turns. Six, eight, whatever. It doesn't really make much difference. I wanted to cover the whole coil. So I think I got about six or eight turns here. It's kind of irrelevant to the actual output. Um, but it's up to you. You can toy around with it. Like a lot of this stuff is really variable. So you can really experiment and try to tune things even better than what I've done so you got the positive going through the capacitors that keeps the charge up so you're, it doesn't crap out on you it gives you a more steady flow of high, high voltage coming through and then you would bring it into your spark gap this is your first spark gap so the positive would come in jump the spark gap and then go to negative of the high voltage module they so have high voltage out and then the negative and then positive, negative for your battery. So make sure you don't mix these two up. They'll be too uh, specific. Like this one here is actually quite a thick wire, so it's pretty obvious what it is. But um, irregardless, be careful. You hook up the right wires to the right thing. Um, so the spark gap, I've got it set at about three millimeters gap in between. So... Um, you can toy around with that width. It could be three millimeters. You can get it down to, if you get it at three millimeters, it's going to make a lot of noise and a lot of white noise. But if you go, say, down to, say, maybe one and a half millimeters, the, the sound's going to be greatly reduced. 
and it's going to be a lot quieter and the frequency is going to be quite a bit higher. So you can toy around with that gap space. Um, all right, let's go to L2. So the L2 is going to have 600 turns of 22 gauge wire. Now I wrap this myself by hand. It's a pain in the ass, but it's got to be done. So I decided I'm going to toy around with this size of a coil for now so I understand the circuit and I can actually make usable power. And then eventually I'm going to upgrade all this to a bigger scale that, you know, what Don Smith is using. First of all, I want to understand what the hell he's doing, right? Because uh, a lot of what I've done here has been all experimentation. And this is what I'm finding that seems to work pretty good. So... All right, so now we're going the top of the L2. We're going to put a high voltage diode. This one can handle 10 kVA. So that's the positive of it, and it's going to go through the second spark gap. Now, this one is where you get that nice purple light that's emanating. And when, see, after the reson, uh, when the frequency gets resonating in here, it's a different kind of energy, and I'll explain that in a minute. So that comes through, and then it's going to jump this spark gap. Again, you can toy with the uh, spark gap distance. I like to have it around 5 millimeters. So you can toy around. It might only work 3. It, it all depends. Everybody's system is going to be slightly different. It's not going to be exactly the same. And it also depends on the amount of voltage you're putting into it, right? Because most of the time, I've been putting about 6 to 7 kVA through this, and it seems to work quite well. So anyways, power comes through, jumps the gap, all right? And then this is where you're going to put your large capacitor bank that's going to up the amperage of your system. I haven't done this yet because I want to make sure everything I have here is correct and it's going to work properly. When you start putting these high voltage capacitors in, you have to be super careful because now you're getting amperage that can kill you. So this area here is very crucial and you got to take precaution because you mess this up in one wrong move, you're going to be on the floor uh, flopping around like a chicken. So, and from there it goes to load. And then the la bottom wire of the L2 comes out and that's actually used as your earth ground. All right. So this is where you would put your load in between here. So I've actually experienced pretty interesting phenomenon. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned it in the last video. Okay, when it transfers power from the L1 to the L2, it's at a high frequency. I figure this one's around three, uh, 30, 30 kilohertz to 36 kilohertz, somewhere in that range. When you get up into that frequency, I figure it was an RF frequency, but it's a resonating RF frequency. And when you get it resonance, okay, now you can transform that power into anything you want, all right? I brought an LED light, all right, close to the LED bulb or even just the wire itself after the spark gap, and I can pick up power. Now, the cool thing is I got a 3-volt LED light, all right? And I went next to it, and I got 7,000 volts going through it, all right? And that light lit up without blowing up. That thing should have blown, it should have went fuck off into next week. But it's not. So I'm figuring <clears throat> exactly what's happening with that is because it's a low resistant light, there's very little resistance in that light, it doesn't draw amperage. If it had a heavy duty resistance on that light, it would have burnt out, it would have fried, it, it could have caught on fire. But because it's a, a, a light emitting diode is basically just that, it goes in one direction. So that's that's where it kind of got confusing and going, holy man, that's 7,000 volts and it's going through a three volt LED light. It should have friggin' fried like beyond belief. But it doesn't. It's because it's in a resonant frequency power source. If I had a larger light there and I had the capacitors hooked up, I would have 
been able to even power a high wattage uh, bulb. No problem because as soon as you put a resistance on this, that's when the amps start flowing. That's when it starts pumping. So I'm starting to kind of understand the science. I could be wrong on this, but in all logic, there's no way that LED light should be able to take 7,000 volts through it. It's impossible. So what kind of frequency, what kind of, you know, um, you know, physics is behind, but, you know, I, I was thinking it's got, it has to do with the internal re uh, resistance of that uh, LED. If it had high resistance, then it would blew the shit right out of that bulb in a second. But because it has li very little resistance, it only pulls in basically enough power that it needs to run it. It doesn't overkill it. It doesn't, it doesn't pump through it. But if it had a lot of resistance on it, then the, uh, the, the power is going to start pumping through it. Especially if you have a capacitor bank behind it to add to the amperage. So that's something, a little bit of a mystery still for me. I'm still kind of trying to figure out the uh, physics on that. So anyways, um, yeah, I just wanted to show everybody the schematic of what I'm working on. And hopefully this can help somebody out in their um, project uh, if you're building along with me. So you can kind of see what I'm up to. Anyways, um, I'll call it quits. Uh, if you like the video, give me a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, give me a thumbs down. Don't forget in the bottom right hand corner there is where you can subscribe to the channel. If you're um, wanting any questions or whatever, please leave a comment below and we'll talk to everybody soon. Take care.